Good morning, everyone. My name is Nan Janke, and on behalf of the Parish Committee, I'd like to welcome you all to the service here at First Parish this morning. Whether you are joining us here in person in the sanctuary or are joining us online on Zoom, we're glad to see you all. A special welcome to any visitors or newcomers to the congregation who are here among us today. Uh, we um, applaud you for your winter hardiness and are happy to see new faces whenever they come. This congregation was gathered in 1640 when the Reverend Edmund Brown led a group of Puritan people west from Watertown to the east bank of the Sudbury River in what is now Wayland. Two years later, these God-fearing people built the first proper meeting house on a plot of land in what is now North Cemetery up on Route 27. Over the years, other meeting houses were built up until 1814, 1815, when the fifth meeting house was built. That's this one, the one that you're sitting in today. That's a lot of history for one congregation, almost 400 years now. And I dare say we don't share many of the beliefs of those first settlers. It's very possible that you don't even share the same religious beliefs as the person sitting next to you in the pews. That's because we've changed a lot as a congregation over these some 400 years, as our understanding of the world has changed, and as the community that surrounds us has become more diverse. Today we are a free-thinking, liberal-minded congregation and proud of it, though I think we all know we still have a lot to learn. Despite all our differences here at First Parish, we do share a common mission and covenant. The mission I'll share with you in a moment, and the covenant we will say all together a little later in the service. Our mission is actually fourfold. It is to build community, to search for meaning, to deepen our spirituality, and to make a better world. If you'd like to learn more about First Parish or about uh, Unitarian Universalism in general, I invite you to check out our website or speak to our minister, the Reverend Dr. Stephanie May, or to our Director of Lifespan Education and Engagement, Kate Holland. Uh, they can answer most any question that you put to them. Uh, many thanks to all of the people who've helped put the service together today. That's the ushers and the greeters and the singers and the lay minister, everyone. It's a work of many hands. Uh, I'm happy to report that the COVID risk level has returned to low in Middlesex County. That means you are free to wear your mask or not as you please, though you might want to speak to the other people in your pew about what, how they feel about it. I do invite you to say hello to uh, your neighbors in the pews and to give a wave to that camera where all the folks who did not come out on this cold winter day are joining us on Zoom. Unless there are, um, are other announcements, our service will now begin. Thank you. 
as Unitarian Universalists committed to the inherent worth and dignity of all persons, we promote and affirm equity and justice in human relations. Today, that means promoting and affirming Black History Month. Begun in Chicago in 1915, the national theme for this year for Black History Month is Black Resistance. We will be looking at this theme through the lens of Boston, particularly the life of William Monroe Trotter. Anyone heard of him? A couple hands, a few hands. I learned a lot. In the era of Jim Crow segregation, Trotter agitated and organized for the civil rights of African Americans guaranteed in the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. He wrote, we are not here as wards. We are not here as dependents. We are not here looking for charity or help. We are fully fledged American citizens vouchsafed equality of citizenship by the federal constitution. Today, let us remember Trotter and the African Americans who have resisted injustice and equality. May we be inspired to also resist the systems of racial injustice that remain today as we work together for a better world. I now invite the Lee King family to come forward to light our chalice, symbol of Unitarian Universalism, and to lead us in our covenant, the promises we make to each other as a community. With op open minds and loving hearts, we gather to search for meaning, to care for one another, and to work together for a better world. Our opening hymn comes from the 1960s. In the spring of 1961, the Congress of Racial Equality organized interracial freedom rides to protest segregated bus terminals in the South. When freedom rider Reverend Robert Wesby was arrested in Mississippi, he rewrote the lyrics of an old gospel hymn to create the song we'll sing today, sung throughout the fight for civil rights in the 1960s and beyond. May we too sing in solidarity for the vision of freedom for all. Please rise in body or in spirit to sing 153. <laughs>
My name is Kate Holland. I'm the Director of Lifespan Education and Engagement here at First Parish, and my pronouns are she, her. I love that Nan started the service with the history of this congregation, because honestly, I actually really love to find out little pieces of history that I've never known before. So this morning, I'm gonna share with you the history of a young, African-American woman named Phyllis Wheatley. Has anybody heard of her? Oh, Nan, good job. So Phyllis Wheatley was a small child in Africa when she was abducted, put in a boat, and sailed across the sea. They took her to the Boston Harbor, and there she was sold to John Wheatley who bought her to be a slave for his wife to help around the house. They named her Phyllis after the boat that she was put on to come to America. In the Wheatley home, Phyllis spent time with their twins, Nathan and Mary, and Nathan and Mary taught her English because she didn't know it when she came here. They taught her to read and to write, and they even taught her Greek and Latin. So the early Bible verses that Mary had taught her when she was a child grew her love of language, and from that, she started to write poetry, beautiful poems. And the Wheatleys would invite her into their parties to recite the poems for their friends, and eventually, many people invited her into their homes during occasions to recite her poems. And Phyllis was really happy about this, but what she really, really wanted is a book of her poetry, because she knew a book would last. A book would be there for her children, her children's children, and long past that. So Phyllis really wanted a book, and so she had enough poems to write a book, but there was a problem. The rich men in Boston didn't believe that a black slave could write poetry as beautifully as she did. So they asked her, 18 of the most important men, the governor, the lieutenant governor, all the ministers, many poets, asked her to appear before them and prove that it was her poetry. Can you imagine how a young woman who had worked so hard to write poems that she was so proud of, to be asked to come in and to prove that it was her work. She knew that no matter what they decided, it was her work. And so she had to appear before them, and there's no record in history what they asked her, but she passed with flying colors and they finally published her poems. She was the first African-American woman to have her poetry published in a book. <clears throat> so it's amazing to me for this story for a lot of reasons. And I first, because it's history that was never taught to me. And second, I think a lot of times myself and others think that in Boston, there were so many abolitionists that slavery just didn't exist here. And that's just not true. And it's part of our history, and as hard as it hear, is to hear it sometimes, we need to remember all the pieces of our history so we can grow. So I'm going to invite my friends um, down to our seat class, and I'm going to invite all of you to please sing us out. Thank you.
Every once in a while, I just change the order of service because I want to. And, um, and also, um, in this, you'll hear why a little bit later in the service. But um, we're now going to sing a hymn, There Is More Love. Sometimes we find ourselves in places of struggle and pain. Our next hymn is one sung from the time of slavery. It is a song of lament for all that is not part of their lives. And it is a song of resistance that holds on to the hope for what the future should be. So remaining seated as we prepare for a time of prayer and meditation, let us sing together in that spirit of lament and hope, hymn number 95. My name is Alyssa Lee. I'm the ministerial intern here at First Parish, and my pronouns are she or they. And I invite you to join me in the spirit of prayer or meditation. Let's take a deep breath in and out. And another deep breath in and out. Spirit of love and connection, we are grateful for the reminder this morning that there is always more love, more hope, more peace to be found. May we additionally remember there is always more justice to search for as well, more liberation to strive toward. As we remember that black history happened here, may we also consider that history is happening now all around us. We are part of the history of this community and this congregation. May we be remembered by how we lived into our values, how we did not forget that though the arm of justice may sometimes feel out of reach, it is not in fact unreachable that our consideration and our kindness will not be mistaken for complacency, 
and that we will know when we are called to speak to our values and when we are called to listen and to learn. Blessed be. I now invite you to spend a moment in stillness, to breathe deeply, and to consider how you are a part of history, how your story is not done being written, and how it is tied to this place and to this community. Debbie Levens, a lay minister of this congregation. This is the time in our service that we set aside to share our joys and our sorrows. In both our sharing and in the support given by our witness, we affirm our covenant to care for one another. To begin, I will light a candle of sorrow for the one-year anniversary of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. We pray for a ceasefire and for world leaders to find their way to peace. I will also light a candle of joy for the celebration of Black History Month and for the opportunity to celebrate the many contributions African Americans have made to our national and our global cultures. If you wish to share, please add your joy or sorrow to the chat now. Or to share in person, please come to the front. As a reminder, you may also submit your joys and sorrows in writing using the slips at each door. And I Thank you, Demi. Today's reading is an excerpt from the introduction of Black Radical, The Life and Times of William Monroe Trotter by Carrie Greenridge. Trotter was a journalist and civil rights activist in Boston in the early 20th century. For 30 years, he published a weekly newspaper called The Guardian. She says, Trotter's nearly endless public protest, state house petitions, and defiant confrontation with white power brokers popularized grassroots civil rights mobilization decades before the Congress of Racial Equality, Equality organized one of the first sit-ins at segregated movie theaters and downtown hotels. And yet, neither Trotter nor Boston are typically acknowledged for their significant role and radical civil rights leadership. 
beyond black Bostonians' role as radical abolitionists in the decades before the Civil War, or the city's dubious distinction as the most racist city in America. The city of the Cabots and the Lowells is frequently dismissed as a gateway to black success rather than an incubator for black radical politics. But in fact, it was a stomping ground for both Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. It was the site of inspiration for editor Pauline Hopkins and Harlem Renaissance writer Dorothy West. Its surrounding areas, particularly renowned institutions across New England, were also significant in the ideological development of Barack Obama, Senator Edward Brooke, and former Massachusetts Governor Deval Patrick. If the violent backlash against school busing in the 1970s has permanently emblazoned in the popular mind the image of Fred Landsmark being beaten with an American flag at City Hall, then the idea that black Bostonians are clannish and provincial, that they have little effect on national discussions of racial politics, is equally ubiquitous. Indeed, some continue to believe the dubious claim that an African-American community of such relatively small size has little effect on national conceptualizations of race and politics. Still, between 1901, when the first issue of The Guardian appeared in Boston, and 1934, William Monroe Trotter placed Boston at the center of radical African-American politics and forced the overwhelmingly white city to live up to the most progressive version of itself.
Thank you, choir. I, as you will hear, I can imagine that Trotter would have considered that a personal anthem for <laughs> In January 19, the United States in January 19, the United States joined with 30 other nations in Paris to negotiate the terms of peace uh, after World War I. You probably knew that. But you may not know that in February of 1919, Paris also hosted a Pan-African Congress. The adjacent meeting sought to ensure that people of African descent held a place within the new global order. Black intellectual leader W.E.B. Dubois traveled to Paris as a representative of the newly organized interracial NAACP. In Paris, Dubois helped to organize the Pan-African Congress, which representatives from 15 nations attended. However, few African nations participated because their colonial governments refused them passports. In her 2020 biography of Boston journalist and activist William Monroe Trotter, historian Carrie K. Greenwich adds to the story. Prior to the January and February 1919 events in Paris, Trotter, a national voice in radical black thought and activism, helped to organize a National Colored Congress for World Democracy in December 1918 in DC. An unrelenting advocate for black-led organizations, Trotter firmly believed not only in racial equality, but in the agency of African Americans to know best what they needed. For decades, he promoted a race-first perspective that called for African Americans to place their full civil rights as promised in the Constitution before allegiance to any political party. By emphasizing independence from party, Trotter sought to make evident the power of black suffrage to sway elections from one party to another. In this way, Trotter hoped to make politicians take notice of the issues important to African-American citizens, race first. By virtue of Trotter's activism and his Boston Weekly paper, The Guardian, Trotter and the various organizations he helped to found were well known to DC politicians by December 1918. Indeed, Trotter had twice met with then President Woodrow Wilson more on that later. The DC Congress was officially sponsored by the Liberty League and included more than 300 African American leaders from 37 states. Together, the attendees drafted an address to present in Paris and also elected 11 delegates to send overseas, a list that included Monroe Trotter. However, the War Department denied passports to all African Americans seeking passage to France, with two exceptions, W.E.B. Du Bois and Tuskegee President Robert Russo Moton, a racial conservative. While Du Bois would form the Pan-African Congress, to the members of the Liberty Leeds DC Congress, the Paris gathering fell far short by tepidly accepting the ongoing European colonization of Africa. Even so, Trotter remained determined to get to Paris. Greenwich reports that Trotter received a crash course in cooking in order to see, receive a laborer's passport as a chef on a ship sailing to France. At Havre on the coast of France, Trotter slipped off the ship to mail a letter and then made his way to Versailles by May. While the treaty had already been sent to Germany for signature, Trotter still presented the DC Congress's demands to all the treaty delegates gathered to make them aware 
of the racial situation in America. Although the final treaty did not reflect these demands, Trotter's international advocacy on behalf of African Americans made huge waves in the press back home. I find this story astounding. And until reading Greenwich's book, I knew none of it, did you? While I have often considered all I do not know about history, I have been increasingly aware of all I particularly do not know about black history and black resistance in history. Sure, we are taught the broad outlines of the practice of slavery in the US from the time we are kids. And as Unitarian Universalists, we are quick to point to our affiliations with white abolitionists, including our own local author activist, Lydia Mariah Child. But what else do I not know? And asking that question, I decided to start relatively local with the city of Boston. Last Saturday, a small group of us journeyed downtown to visit the Museum of African American History and to walk the Black Heritage Trail on Beacon Hill. While vaguely aware that this area had been a site of African American residences, I had not Im imagined the thriving community that existed on the north side of Beacon Hill and Boston's West End. From opening the first public school for African American children, to hosting innumerable lectures, concerts, and worship services at the African American Meeting House, the community cultivated economic, social, civic, religious, and political networks. From this West End community, African American residents of Boston later began to move to the South End and the adjacent Lower Roxbury, areas where William Monroe Trotter would spend most of his life. Son of a man with his own remarkable history, Monroe Trotter grew up in relative comfort and then graduated from Harvard College. After struggling to find employment fitting to his education, Trotter began both his own real estate business and a weekly newspaper, The Guardian. Conscious of history, to publish The Guardian, Trotter rented out the same office space on Tremont Street from which William Lloyd Garrison had published the 19th century abolitionist paper, The Liberator. Historical awareness of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the Constitution, which guaranteed equality and civil rights for African Americans, also fueled Trotter. Trotter's father and his generation had fought for those rights and for a time enjoyed political representation in Massachusetts and beyond. The effective removal of black suffrage in southern states enraged Trotter. And after decades of evidence to the contrary, Trotter did not trust the Republicans, the party of Lincoln, to guarantee either black suffrage or civil rights. In The Guardian, Trotter spoke up on these issues and did so in a direct, even angry manner that was indeed radical for its time. For during that era, the most prominent African-American voice was Booker T. Washington, president of the Tuskegee Institute. But to Trotter and other radicals, Washington was an accommodationist who accepted the status quo of segregation in exchange for a handful of political appointments to weak positions in the federal government. While Trotter and the intellectual leader W.E.V. Du Bois initially collaborated in 1905 on the black-led Niagara movement, the forerunner to the NAACP. They fell out when Du Bois included persons Trotter had grudges against. Let's just say the author Greenwich portrays Trotter action, actions in this episode as less than fully mature, even referring to them as tantrums. So Trotter wasn't perfect. And yet he did something neither Washington nor Du Bois managed. He built out a coalition across class lines 
to support his race-first politics, all from Tremont Street in Boston. Unfortunately, Trotter burned through the fortune received from his father. To sustain the Guardian, he relied on the support and hard work of his mother, Virginia, his wife, Deanie, and his sisters, Maud and Bessie. His wife, Deanie, died of the Sp Spanish flu just three months before the DC Congress in 1918. Still, Trotter continued with the Guardian for many more years until becoming overwhelmed in the 1930s by financial struggles, political divisions within the African-American community, and the continued failure of the American government to protect black citizens. On April 7, 1934, his 62nd birthday, Trotter died by apparent suicide. When he died, the power of the coalition Trotter had built was evident. As Greenwich writes, quote, alone amongst his contemporaries, William Monroe Trotter appealed to the black genteel poor from Boston to Cleveland, while attracting the ire, the uncomfortable tolerance, and eventually the begrudging respect of the colored elite. At his death, Everyone from Harlem politician Adam Clayton Powell Jr. to Howard University conservative Kelly Miller to Pan-African communist George Padmore offered Trotter their heartfelt thanks. Without the guardian of Boston, Adam Clayton Powell stated, the teeming masses in Harlem, in Chicago, in Detroit would have no heroes. Trotter was a hero in his era because he spoke out without apology for racial equality. He did this as a columnist in The Guardian, as a public speaker in the innumerable rallies he organized at Faneuil Hall, in the race-first organizations and institutions he helped to establish, and even when he met the president. The first time Trotter met Woodrow Wilson. He was sizing up whether Wilson, a Democrat who was a candidate, would promote racial equality and black civil rights. Trotter was impressed by William's demeanor towards him and apparent sincerity in listening to Trotter's concerns. And yet when Wilson became president, he segregated the federal workforce for the first time in like 35 years. Thus, when Trotter next met with the president, he directly expressed his dismay at Wilson's actions and policies. While Wilson's administration would not change course, Trotter nonetheless became a hero for doing something astounding, speaking up for equality without apology to the president of the United States as a black man. Maybe this is not as ast astonishing to us today. The expression of rage in politics seems to be too commonplace. But at the start of the 20th century, the idea of an African-American man speaking as an equal to white men, even to a white man of power like President Wilson, was a very bold action. Trotter was not content to wait, to accommodate, to accept whatever white progressives and liberals might offer. Trotter believed that the African American community were already full citizens, capable of self-direction, and advocating for the civil rights promised in the Constitution and now denied them. For this, he is known as a radical. As a middle-aged white woman from the Midwest, I've never been comfortable identifying as a radical. I'm much more comfortable in the white liberal camp on working within systems to make things better over time. Which is why reading about Trotter unsettles me. Looking back, Trotter so clearly seems to be right 
and his advocacy for racial equality, black suffrage, and the enforcement of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. Ann Trotter wasn't perfect. Still, I wonder in what ways my own moderate impulses may be blinding me to the just urgency that I hear from today's black radicals the voices of the movement for black lives that call for the end of anti-black practices of mass incarceration, surveillance of black communities, ongoing economic inequality, and more. And in the meantime, the town of Wayland is straining beneath racial tensions surrounding events in the schools. Much remains publicly unknown and the events of the conflict between the school committee, teachers, parents, and the superintendent. Whatever the eventual outcome of the employment issues might be, what does seem clear to me is that as a predominantly white community, Wayland is still struggling with how to navigate dynamics of racial difference and bias in our schools and wider community. So as a religious community that states a commitment to the inherent worth and dignity of all persons, as well as equity and justice and human relations, how might we play a role as individuals and as a congregation in learning how to better navigate these dynamics? I don't have any simple answers. I don't think there are any simple answers. Although I do know that you can buy a bracelet to support fundraising for diversity, equity, and inclusion programs from Jada and Luca in coffee hour today. And I know it's made a difference to me to learn more about the stories of black resistance, such as Trotter's story, as well as those recounted in the Museum of African American History in Boston. Such stories chip away at the bias to white paternalism that I have unconsciously inherited. Slowly, I learn to better respect the full agency of African Americans to speak out and lead on the issues that impact their lives. Slowly, I learn to recognize I do not know about black, all I do not know about black history and the African American experience. And slowly I learn, I hope, to be a better ally and accomplice in the ongoing work for racial justice. My hope for all of us is that we remain grounded in our shared values of affirming human dignity and equity as we navigate the sometimes messy and painful work of building a, more better, a better, more just world. So may it be. Amen. As I've shared in the sermon, there is much to learn at the Museum of African American History and the Black Heritage Trail on Beacon Hill, and I urge you to go. And we thought about giving our offering to them, but they seem to have some really big corporate donors, so we went looking for another organization. And talking to Mary Margaret Earle of the UU Urban Ministry in um, Boston, Roxbury, she recommended the Roxbury Historical Society. There is also so much significant history of African Americans in Roxbury. So today our offering will be shared with the Roxbury Historical Society to support their work in promoting the rich history of their community. And I don't know if anybody else remembers this, but back in March of 2018, the Roxbury Historical Society and the UU Urban Ministry did a joint program of, of the resistance of stopping the highway through Roxbury in the early 1970s. And First Parish in Wayland was the sponsor of that event. Um, so let us continue to support the Roxbury Historical Society with a generous offering today. You may either give as um, boxes come by, you can give online at uuwayland.org slash donate, or those orange cards in the pews have the QR code to go online also. Thank you for giving generously to share with the Roxbury Historical Society.
Initially, we had hoped to have a testimonial in this spot of congregants who have made learning more about African American history and experience a significant part of their lives, and that was the Trimbies. And they're, of course, not able to be here today. I wanted to pause for a moment to acknowledge all of you who I know have sought out opportunities to know more about black history and black resistance to injustice. And there is also room to learn more, to become better allies, and to consider how we might indeed help to promote more racial equity in our communities. And so we close with a song of commitment. Hymn number 1028 in your teal hymnals, The Fire of Commitment. Please rise in body or in spirit. And it does have a page turn, I believe, so you're not surprised. <laughs> Just a reminder that you can buy your bracelets from Jada and Luca downstairs. I think it's $5, and that money goes to an initiative, I think it's of middle school kids, that are trying to fundraise to get some anti-racism education in the school. And you can also just donate money if you don't want a bracelet. Um, and to the, our folks online, thanks for being with us, and just stay online to um, chat with each other as when the benediction's over. Sustained by our connections to each other and to all that is holy, let us go and be beyond these walls, bringing more light and life, love and justice to our shared world. Amen.